In this lesson, we will present some of the basic tools that will be used to prove properties of integers. These two basic principles of integers are the well-ordering principle and the principle of mathematical induction. Recall that number theory is a study of properties of the natural numbers. The symbol for the natural numbers is a bold N. This is the set containing the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But we also often think of these as a, a subset of, of the integers, which I will denote by a bold Z. So the integers not only can, contain the natural numbers, but also the negatives of those numbers and zero. So this is the set containing numbers like uh, dot, 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 negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and three, and so on. Okay, so oftentimes instead of natural numbers, we could refer to the natural numbers as just the positive integers. Well, the first tool we will discuss is uh, an axiom on the integers, and therefore we will uh, we'll assume that it's true without proof, um, the, the well-ordering principle. And for abbreviation, I'll use WOP for the well-ordering principle in the future. Well, the well-ordering principle says that any non-empty subset of the natural numbers contains a smallest element. And so this is going to be a uh, very powerful tool that we'll use in uh, in many theorems. And uh, so we can say that, for example, any subset of the natural numbers is what we say uh, well-ordered, has this well-ordering property. While uh, if you think of the set of all, all integers, for example, um, the set of all integers is not well-ordered. You can't find a smallest or least um, integer in, in a set of, of all integers. But given any, any non-empty subset of the natural numbers, it is true that there is a smallest element. And just kind of as a kind of a fun theorem, let's just call this a fact. We're going to use the well-ordering principle to prove this. The fact is that all natural numbers are interesting. Now, this, I'm not giving a mathematical definition of interesting. Just, uh, just take the everyday meaning of, of interesting. So the proof is going to be, uh, we'll use the well-ordered principle. Well, um, so this is a proof kind of by contradiction. Let's say that uh, there actually are some natural numbers that are not interesting. I'm going to let S stand for the set of of uh, natural numbers such that uh, n is not interesting. Then let's suppose that, that, that s is not empty. Well, if s is not empty, And what does the well-ordering principle tell us? Well, if it, it tells us that there's a smallest element in this set. So then by um, the well-ordering principle, S contains a, has a smallest element. Call that uh, element, uh, say the number, the letter A. 
potential to the smallest animal. Well, if you think about it, being the smallest is a superlative. I mean, that's a superlative word. The smallest of anything is is uh, is kind of interesting. So, in particular, the smallest element of this set S would therefore be interesting. But being the smallest. makes a interesting well if a is interesting and a is a natural number then it can't be an s so as we see s doesn't have a smallest element Therefore, therefore, S is, is empty. So we can conclude that, uh, in fact, all natural numbers are interesting. So this is kind of a, you know, a silly example of, of the use of the well-ordered principle. But this is actually a typical type of usage that, that pops up in, in theorems. You have a set, an, 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 a non-empty set of, of natural numbers. And somehow using the, the smallest element will be a key point in, in proving the theorem. Now the next result that we, the next principle we talk about is a, another valuable tool uh, for proving results about integers. And this is actually equivalent to the well-ordering principle. It's called the principle of mathematical induction. And we want to abbreviate this with P as PMI for principle of mathematical induction. So this is a, we'll prove here in a, in a few minutes that this is actually equivalent to the well ordering principle. But what this says is that suppose uh, you have a set S that's a subset of the natural numbers. Okay, so if if S is a subset of the natural numbers. Uh, with these two properties, first, uh, the, the the element one is in the set. Okay, and second. For all uh, natural numbers n, if n is in the set S, then n plus 1 is also in the set. Okay, so if you have a set that's a subset of the natural numbers with these two properties, 1 is in S, and then if n is in S, and n plus 1 is in S, then we can conclude that n that the, the set S actually contains all natural numbers and therefore equals the natural numbers. Okay. So this is called the principle of mathematical induction. And we'll show I'll show you some examples of how to prove statements about natural numbers using the principle of mathematical induction, or simply just saying by induction. But first, I'm going to show you that this is actually equivalent to the well-ordering principle. First, I want to show that the well-ordering principle implies the principle of mathematical induction. Okay, so here's the, here's the proof of, uh, of this implication. Let S be a subset of the natural numbers. Let's just sum before our subset. Okay. Let S be a subset of the natural numbers with uh, with one in in S. And the integer n plus one is in S. 
whenever n is in s. And what I need to show is that um, s actually equals the set of natural numbers. But by way of contradiction, let's assume that that s does not equal the natural numbers. Okay. Then there must be some natural number or natural numbers that are not in s. By the well ordered principle, there there must be a least element, let's call it A, that is not an S. Let's say A. that is not an S. Well, clearly A can't equal 1 because we already said that 1 is in is in S. Well, if, if A is a, a natural number and um, it's it's not 1, so it must be bigger than 1, and we can assume that a minus 1 is also a natural number. And since a minus 1 is smaller than a, um, a, a minus 1 must be an s. Why? Well, we assumed that A was the smallest natural number that was not in S. So A minus 1 must be in S. But by the second property of S, if you add 1 to A minus 1, you get A, and this element must be in S. So by the second property of S, A must be an S. But this is a contradiction. Therefore, our original assumption that S does not equal the natural numbers must have been false. So we've just shown that the well-ordering principle implies the principle of mathematical induction. Now I'm going to prove that the principle of mathematical induction implies the well-ordering principle. So let's assume that the principle of mathematical induction holds for all natural numbers. Okay. Let's take any um, non-empty subset of the natural numbers. Let's call it S. Let S be a non-empty subset of the natural numbers. And let's consider all the natural numbers that are not in not in S. So um, let's call that. Uh, that's at t. So let t 
B, uh, the difference of the natural numbers and the set S. So by definition, this is the set of all natural numbers that are not in S. Okay. Well, we assume that um, S was non-empty. S is, uh, does not equal the empty set. So there's some elements, some natural numbers that are in S, okay? And therefore, T can't equal all of the natural numbers because we just said that some, some elements are in S, okay? So T is like the complement of, 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 of S, if you think of it that way. It's a set of all natural numbers that are not in S. So since S is not empty, T does not equal the set of all natural numbers. Well, for the sake of contradiction, let's suppose that S contains no smallest element. Okay. Okay, so suppose that uh, S has no smallest element. Since one is the smallest element of all natural numbers and S has no smallest element, one can't be an S, okay? So this is really kind of the basis step here that we're using. Since one is the smallest natural number one can't be an S otherwise it would be the smallest element of S and we just we assume that S has no smallest element so one must be in T Now I'm going to suppose that there, you have some some natural number in T. Okay, so it's the second part here. Suppose some natural number is in T. Okay. Well, it turns out that no number, no natural number less than n can be in S. Okay. So no natural number less than n is in S. Why? Well, because if any number, if any of the numbers 1 through n minus 1 were in S, then one of those numbers would be the smallest element of S. Okay? So if any of the numbers one, two, three, all the way up to n minus one were an S, then one of those numbers would be the smallest element of S. And remember, we, we already assumed that S has no smallest element. Okay, so the numbers 1 through n minus 1 can't be an S, but n can't be an S either, because we said n is in T. So therefore, n plus 1 can't be an S, otherwise that would be the smallest element of S. So what we have so far is that 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n minus 1 and n are not in S. Then n minus n plus 1 is not an S, otherwise it would be 
the smallest element. So n plus 1 must be in t. Well, what have we just shown? We've shown that 1 is in t, and then we've shown that if n is in t, then n plus 1 is in t. We've shown that uh, 1 is in t, and we've shown that n plus 1 is in t whenever n is in t. By the principle of mathematical induction, we can assume that t contains all natural numbers. But this contradicts our earlier statement that t does not equal in all natural numbers. So our original assumption that s has no smallest element must have been false. Thus s has a uh, smallest element. So we've shown that the principle of mathematical induction implies the well-ordered principle. And therefore, since we already proved the reverse implication, we can assume that these uh, principles are actually equivalent. So the principle of mathematical induction it's equivalent to the well-ordered principle. So these are both valuable tools in proving statements about integers. And since they're equivalent, you know, one one technique, one principle, uh, would be might fit better in your given proof. That's why you might want to choose one principle over the other. So in this last proof, we uh, we actually demonstrated how you would prove a statement using the principle of mathematical induction. So there's kind of a a, a template, a proof template that you, you want to follow every time you're using, trying to prove a statement using the principle of mathematical induction. So let's talk about the proof template. For proving a statement using using the principle of mathematical induction. Okay. So you have a statement that you want to tr prove that's true for all natural numbers. So to show some statement uh, Sn is true for all natural numbers n, the first step we call this the basis step. Okay. The basis step is to show that the first statement, S1, is true. Okay. In other words, show, show that the statement is true for, for n equals 1. Okay. Then the second step is called the inductive step. And the inductive step is, uh, includes what we call the inductive hypothesis. Okay, So we say that, so in this step, we, we suppose that the statement is true for some natural number n. Okay, So suppose that uh, statement Fn is true. For some natural number n. Uh, 
Um, and then we need to show that this forces the next statement to be true for the next natural number. So we need to show that this actually forces s n plus 1 to be true. Okay, so in this inductive step, we assume s n is true and show that that implies that s n plus 1 is also true. Well, by then the, the final step to proving a statement using the principle of mathematical induction is the conclusion. By step, once you've shown step one and step two, and then we can assume by the principle of mathematical induction that SN is true for all natural numbers. So you usually just summarize what, you, what you're doing in your proof. You say something like by steps one and two, and the principle of mathematical induction, Sn is true for all natural numbers. Now I'll give some examples of proving statements using the principle of mathematical induction. The first statement I'm going to prove is a nice little formula for adding up the first n uh, natural numbers. Okay, so for all natural numbers n, if you add up the first natural and n natural numbers, you get you get like sum like this: one plus two plus three, all the way up to n. Then it's actually a nice little formula. This will actually equal n times n plus one divided by two. Okay. So this is a statement about the, this is making a claim uh, for all natural numbers. So this is a, the perfect type of, uh, of theorem to prove by the principle of mathematical induction. So when you want to prove a statement is true for all natural numbers, you should go to the principle of mathematical induction. Okay, so we've got to first prove that this, our basis step, that the statement is true for n equals 1. So remember, this is, this is called the, the basis step. Well, for, for n equals 1, the statement is well, on the left hand side, it's just this. There's only one sum and the number one. On the right hand side, the formula would be one times two divided by two. Well, one does equal uh, two divided by two. So the statement, so the first statement is is true. Next, we need to do uh, show the uh, inductive step. So we're going to assume that the statement is true for some natural number n. Suppose the formula holds for some natural number n. Then we have the equation 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n equals n times n plus 1 over 2. What we need to show is that if I add up the first n plus 1 numbers, that 1 plus 2 plus 3 
all the way up to n plus 1, we need to show that, that, e that this statement equals n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. And we're only going to use the fact our inductive hypothesis that the sum of 1 through n equals n times n plus 1 over 2. So if we start with that equation and add n plus 1 to both sides, we have We have the sum of 1 through n plus 1 equals n times n plus 1 over 2 plus n plus 1. But if I combine the, the terms on the right-hand side, I see that this, by getting a common denominator, this equals n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 2 times n plus 1 over 2. And I can add these fractions together. I get n times n plus 1 plus 2 times n plus 1 all over 2. When I look at the numerator, I see that there's two big I see that there's two big terms, each with a factor of n plus 1. So let me factor out an n plus 1 from both of these terms. And from the first group, I'm left with a factor of n. And from the second group, I'm left with a factor of 2. I still have this all over the denominator 2. And that's exactly what I needed to show that the sum and so if I can conclude that 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n plus 1 does equal n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. So finally our conclusion Just to summarize, by the principle of mathematical induction, it is true that 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n equals n times n plus 1 over 2 for all, for all natural numbers n. So we just used the principle of mathematical induction to prove that for any natural number n, the sum of 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n equals n times n plus 1 over 2. But here's uh, a proof, another proof of this theorem that's accredited to Carl Gauss, which I mentioned in the, the first video. And this, what's amazing about this proof is that he was only 10 years old, as the story goes, that uh, his... He was in class, and his, and his teacher asked him to add up the first 100 numbers, and so he he came up with this formula to add up the first 100 numbers, and so this was a early, very early indication of how how amazing he was as a, as a mathematician. But so this doesn't use this proof doesn't use the principle of mathematical induction. But what what Gauss did, he said, well let's define S n to be the sum of the first n uh, natural numbers. So one plus two plus three plus all the way to n. And you notice that if I if you write this sum backwards, this also equals the same sum. So now I'm going to write n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way down to the last sum n, which was 1. So I've added the same n numbers twice. And then he notes that if he adds both sides of these equations together, Sn plus Sn gives you 2Sn, and that's that's the sum we're trying to, to find, a formula for. But now if you add these terms pairwise, 1 plus n, you get n plus 1. If you add 2 plus n plus n, 2 plus n minus 1, you, you get n plus 1. If you add 3 plus n minus 2, you get n plus 1. So as you add up these terms pairwise, two at a time, you're going to you're going to always get a sum of n plus 1. 
and you notice that there's a total of n pairs of these numbers. If you go from one to, one to n, that's it's going to give you uh, n total pairs. So adding n plus one plus n plus one plus n plus one, a, a total of n times, can also be written as n times n plus one. And if you notice that this is essentially the the, the end of the theorem, because if we divide both sides by two, we get that the sum of the first n integers equals n times n plus one over two. So in number theory, we deal with sums of natural numbers or sums of integers quite often. And so we've come up with a, a notation that is much it's kind of an abbreviated sum instead of using dot 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 and just kind of ending somewhere we have what we call sigma notation so I'm going to take a few, take a few minutes to describe sigma notation because we'll we'll use this so often so we use the Greek letter sigma which is the Greek letter for s this is the capital sigma and sigma stands for sum Okay, so in the last in the last theorem, we showed we looked at a, a sum like this: one plus two plus three, all the way up to n. Okay, well this can be written in sigma notation as you have a sigma for a sum, and you're adding up uh, the numbers. Let's call them i. So i just is is a is a variable. And the variable i will go from i equals 1 all the way up to n. Okay, So we, we read this as the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. Okay, And so, for example, if you had the sum i equals 1 to 3, for example, of i, the way you would evaluate it is you would let i first equal 1, and then equal 2, and then equal 3, and you add these terms together. So, so this would equal a total of 6. Okay, So the first, the sum of the first n integers, you know, this theorem we had earlier, you could have written this as the, the sum from i equals 1 to n of, of i, and that equals n times n plus 1 over 2. So we'll see this sigma notation um, quite a bit this semester, so I wanted to take time to mention that now. So another theorem we can prove about odd numbers, there's actually a special formula for the sum of the first n odd numbers. So an odd number looks like one more than a multiple of 2, or you can think of it as one less than a multiple of 2. So let's look at the how we could write the sum of the first n odd numbers and n odd natural numbers in sigma notation. So 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 dot 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 dot. So the nth odd number, the formula for the nth odd number would actually equal 2n minus 1. So 2n being the nth even number and if you subtract 1 you get the nth, nth odd number. So let's write this sum using sigma notation. Okay. So we have a sigma, we're going to use i, sometimes called a dummy variable. The first value for i often is, is, is 1, usually it's 1, sometimes it could be 0. But in this case, we want i go from 1 to n, so we're going to have a total of n terms. And the formula, each, each odd integer can be given by the formula 2i minus 1. So the first odd integer would be 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. The second odd integer would be 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 3. The third odd integer would be i equals 3. You just plug in i equals 3, so 2 times 3 minus 1. Okay, So this is how you would write the sum of the first n odd numbers using sigma notation. So I mentioned that there's a formula for the sum of the first n odd numbers. Let's look at some examples. 1, the sum of 1, the first odd integer, is just 1. 1 plus 3 
equals 4. 1 plus 3 plus 5 equals 9. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 equals 16. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 equals 25. Now look at the look at the, the totals, the sum totals. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. You probably see a pattern already. Let's do one more example. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 equals 36. You probably notice that all the, the, the sum of the first n odd numbers seems to be a perfect square. 1, you think of 1 as 1 squared, 4 is 2 squared, 9 is 3 squared, 16 is 4 squared, 5 squared, and 6 squared. So it is a fact that the sum of the first n odd integers equals n squared. So 1 plus 3 plus 5 dot 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 plus the nth odd integer, remember we said is 2n minus 1. So if you add the first n odd natural numbers, you get n squared. And we're going to prove this theorem using induction. So the statement is, for all natural numbers n, the sum of the first n odd integers, so remember how you wrote that in sigma notation, i equals 1 to n of 2i minus 1, that's the sum of the first n odd integers, odd natural numbers, this will equal n squared. So we're going to proof, prove this by induction. First, the basis step. So for n equals 1, the statement is 1 equals 1 squared, which is which is true. So the statement is true for n equals 1. Now it's important to understand that in the next step, the inductive hypothesis step, we're not going to assume that the theorem is true for all natural numbers. We're simply going to assume that it's true for some natural number n and show that that implies that it must be true for the next natural number, which is n plus 1. Okay. So we're not impl we're not assuming that the theorem is true. We're just assuming that the, the formula holds for some particular n. So suppose sum the first n odd integers equals n squared for some integer n. Okay, so we're not saying for all integers n, we're just saying suppose this formula holds for one integer n. Then we want to show that the sum of the first n plus 1 integers has to equal n plus 1, the quantity squared. So we want to show that the sum from i equals 1 to n plus 1 of 2i minus 1 equals n plus 1 the quantity squared. Okay, so that's what we need to show. And we're going to use our inductive hypothesis that the sum of the first n odd integers equals n squared to prove this. Okay, so we need to know where we're going. Well, let's start with our our sum um, that we want to sh show equals n plus 1 squared. So we want to show that this sum the sum of the first n plus 1 odd integers, we want to show this equals n plus 1, the quantity squared. 
Well, if I take off the last sum and of this sum, I get the sum from i equals 1 to n of 2i minus 1. And the last term would be 2 times n plus 1 minus 1. So in the, first, in the original sum over here, the last sum and is when I replace i with n plus 1. So that'll look like 2 times n plus 1 minus 1. Well, we, kn we know that this sum right here equals n squared. We assume that this, is, this equals n squared. So let's replace that with n squared. And that still equals plus 2 times n plus 1 quantity minus 1. And if we multiply this out, we get n squared plus 2n plus 2 minus 1. So let me rewrite that. So we have n squared plus 2n plus 2 minus 1. And combine like terms, we get n squared plus 2n plus 1. And this is a trinomial that we can factor as n plus 1 times n plus 1, which can be written as n plus 1, the quantity squared. So that's what we needed to show. We started with, we have a long chain of equations, and we started with the sum of the first n plus 1 odd numbers. And we showed that that equals n plus 1 the quantity squared. So we've shown that this statement is true for n equals 1. We showed that if it's true for n, then it's the, the formula holds for n plus 1. Therefore, our conclusion, by the principle of mathematical induction, the statement is true for all n. That is, that the sum of the first n odd numbers equals n squared.